Well, thank you, Kevin. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank uh, those of you who are inside the computer or inside the screen that's inside the computer. Um, I'm uh, delighted to be here in Texas. Uh, this is where the action is. So I'll try to add to, uh, to the fire that is burning. Um, so doing business in a post-apocalyptic world. Uh, we are here in the name of challenging orthodoxy. And so I'm going to be, uh, begin with a quote from the lord of counterintuitive thinking himself, Mr. Peter Thiel. In a recent conversation hosted by the Lincoln Network, Thiel observes that, quote, in the 17th or 18th century, the self-styled deists or rational thinkers were the anti-church people, and the church was considered excessively dogmatic. And now it's the opposite. It's Orthodox Christians who are the most heterodox independent thinkers left in this country, unquote. This may seem an odd place to begin thinking through the way that technology has changed how we do business and have to do business in America. Orthodox Christianity is gaining in popularity among some Americans, but is still barely pushing 1% adherence in the national population. Even if that jumps up to 10% uh, over the next few years, uh, we are still probably quite a ways off from discovering what a really American orthodoxy looks like. Just one example of how heterodox orthodox theology seems to Americans is its expectation of God's bodily resurrection of the dead in the end times. It is a little funny to me that this idea is a scandal among people willing to blindly believe that human consciousness will eventually be slurped out of our bodies and poured into our machines. Mm -hmm. But actually, bodily resurrection is straight out of the Nicene Creed, and so really any Christian uh, should or could be thinking this way. And from this standpoint, the real scandal is that so many don't, even though lots of Christians continue to fall into the very old pattern of actively hoping for the end times, for the apocalypse. Why they do this if they don't believe in bodily resurrection is an interesting question. And the answer appears in many cases to be because they don't believe in the bodily resurrection. Many Christians in America appear interested not just in being done with the bother of the sinful world, but to be rid of their human bodies altogether, beaming up into a kind of infinite spiritual commune that seems not so different from the uploaded consciousness of the so-called futurist imagination. This old pattern <clears throat> of trying to call down the divine liberation of the spirit from the confines of the accursed physical world is known as Gnosticism, from the Greek word for knowledge, as in secret knowledge, the secret knowledge about how you, ostensibly, can destroy the grip of the created world on the divinity inside you waiting to be turned loose. You can find Gnostic heresies in every age and every denomination of Christianity. And in that regard, orthodoxy is no exception. Although even here, orthodoxy distinguishes itself today in the strength of its theological determination to reject the idea that we're really pure spirit beings and that the afterlife of such beings is the real life which we must actively aspire to and work to usher in. This insistence arises fundamentally from a faith that Jesus was serious when he said, only God the Father knew when the end times were to come. That it isn't ours to know or to say because we humans are created to be humans before, during, and after the end times. This idea that we are human forever is really the most heterodox thing an American can say in the face of the smothering dogma asserted by our globalized technocratic elite. Their view is summed up by Bill Gates' favorite so-called futurist, the gay Jewish atheist Yuval Noah Harari, who is out there preaching the anti-gospel that, quote, Jesus rising from the dead and being the son of God is fake news, unquote. Even if Jesus couldn't rise from the dead, then you're definitely not going to yourself. Unless you want to be decayed bones or a pile of ash, you need Harari and his crew to be the priests of a new technological god one powerful enough to end human time and human identity by copying and pasting your consciousness into the Borg. If, that is, you do as you're told. Now, the word apocalypse is another word with Greek origins, in this case meaning revelation in the sense of something major being revealed or disclosed. The Gnostic apocalypse 
is one where the revelation is a perfect way for who you really are to be liberated in a purified form from the irredeemable constraints of the given world. This is why the so-called trans movement has rocketed up to the top of everyone's consciousness. Trans means transhumanism, using technology to give spirit a weapon powerful enough to destroy the given forms of our human being. In an age where it is now possible to do such violence to one's own humanity, transforming oneself into a cyborg, the Gnostic Christian meaning of revelation, a rapture where those who wish for it well enough are rewarded by leveling up to pure spirit status, loses whatever distinctiveness it used to have. It also becomes much more dangerous. Digital technology has, in this sense, already ushered in an apocalypse. What it reveals is that automated tools we designed to do our bidding more perfectly than ever are now being intended to destroy our sinful human being and replace it with a sacred cyborg swarm. What it reveals is that this shocking transformation is a theological response to the incredible power of the swarm of digital entities we unleashed on the world. Entities so powerful that now no human or group of humans can rule the world instead. Unable to beat them, you must join them, say the priests of the new swarm god, and by join, they mean worship in the all-consuming manner and mode they prescribe. And sure enough, hundreds of millions of Americans are already being conditioned to worship this swarm Borg. As Marshall McLuhan showed decades ago, digital technology is a medium, not a god, but media reshape and rework our inner and outer lives in such profoundly environmental ways that people ignorant of this process, which Aristotle called formal cause, easily or instinctively mistake it for divine agency. On the orthodox count, Rather than being created with original sin, we humans become mortal by rejecting God's authority, that is, by worshiping other things instead of God. You don't have to be a theologian to recognize how worshipful of our technology we have become. Norbert Wiener, the founder of cybernetics, railed against the gadget worshipers, taking over in the 1960s before his death. And today our gadgets are more powerful, authoritative, and spiritual than ever before. Think about it. Most Americans by far experience digital technology today in its most disincarnate forms, interacting constantly with the invisible, innumerable, instantaneously interoperable information entities that fly at will through our buildings and our bodies and our minds. Some might even say through our souls. Until just a few years ago, these properties were, since the dawn of human space-time, reserved for spiritual beings, namely angels and demons. For people programmed by modern and postmodern propaganda to believe religion was fake news, the sudden domination of the world and of their most intimate lives by the alien race of the cyber swarm was an apocalypse truly out of the blue, a godlike eruption beyond comprehension that demanded what it instinctively triggered genuflection, protestration, the repeated pouring out of sacrificial libations that gave us the root word of our term responsibility. Of all the idols we have worshiped instead of God, the digital swarm is the most plausible of them all. All told then, what Americans need to recognize is that, the, is that all the crisis mongering coming down from the techno priests about the human caused apocalypse to come, the climate apocalypse, the pandemic apocalypse, the population apocalypse, the consumption apocalypse, the apocalypse of race and class and sexual injustice, the real apocalypse that we need to worry about is the one that has already happened, the conquest of the entire world by the digital entities swarm. Yes, if the new priests of the cyborg theocracy have their way, life will get even worse, far worse than most Americans are willing and possibly able to imagine. But the way to stop that dystopian outcome is not by competing to dream up the most terrifying scenario. It is to understand what has already irreversibly happened and to take action from there that can preserve our American form of government, our American way of life, and our given human identity as incarnate and souled beings. 
If anything might be a nonpartisan agenda, you would think that this might be it. But for reasons I doubt I need to explain, most people today who are focused on saving American civilization and saving our human nature are focused on using political weapons and tools to do so. There certainly isn't anything wrong with that approach. If the American people become unable to practice politics in a way that ensures their government and regime preserve America and Americans' identity, the task of preserving our way of life and our human being becomes incredibly more difficult. But if politics is necessary, not sufficient, it is not sufficient. And that is because, at most, our regime can only make a shelter for us under which we can live faithfully, fruitfully, and felicitously. The task falls to us, not to our rulers, to actually do life in that way. Alexis de Tocqueville understood this as well as anyone. His counsel for our statesmen was to force us, however awkwardly, to deal with our problems politically, face to face, neighbor to neighbor, not on any ideological grounds, but because without that hard practice, our taste for freedom would lapse and our hearts would shrink back into isolated and disconnected self-enclosure, corrupting and ultimately destroying not just our form of government, but our human and spiritual vitality. Like Montesquieu, Hobbes, and other political theorists before him, Tocqueville understood political science as ultimately a question of the movement of human bodies in space over time. The knowledge proper to politics was the knowledge of movement salutary to human life and of the structures of law, habit, and mores that conduced to and protected that movement, which could never be abstracted into a single pattern, contemptuous of the particular conditions in a people's particular space-time, without sterilizing, and so ending, eventually, human life itself. Quote, to force all men to march with the same step toward the same purpose, that is a human idea, wrote Tocqueville to introduce an infinite variety in actions, but to combine them so that all these actions lead by a thousand paths toward the accomplishment of a great design that is a divine idea." Unquote. Just so. But the cyborg swarm and its priests have introduced dangerous new complications. While we might see today's imposition of a social credit system complete with a woke and queerist civic religion, as a stultifying forced march toward one destination, the priests of the cyber swarm insist that they are in fact the new masters of an infinity of choices and actions. They are merely the only ethical experts, they say, qualified to interact with the swarm at the highest spiritual and scientific level, studying it, learning from it, nudging and guiding and directing it toward our post-human purification in the manner they and their machines best determine. Let me suggest that what Tocqueville really means is that it's only our given human being itself through which infinite variety in actions has been introduced into the world. And that understanding this means understanding to whom our savingly fruitful variety is owed. Innovate as we might, innovating away our humanity can only spirit away the generativity of active life. The energy of the soul cannot be substituted by the energy of the machine. Because this point is fundamental to human existence, it is one that has not been lost on another more recent observer of American life, the truly heterodox Vladimir Putin. While Russia in many ways continues to illustrate Tocqueville's warning that the world faced an alternative between equality in freedom and equality in servitude, Putin's recent and repeated remarks about the catastrophe of communism reinforced Tocqueville's insight into the political irreplaceability of the natural social movement of ensouled human bodies. In his recent Valdai address, Putin warned that Russia's, quote, difficult and sometimes tragic history showed, quote, the cost of ill-conceived social experiments is sometimes beyond estimation. Such actions, he said, can destroy not only the material, but also the spiritual foundations of human existence, leaving behind moral wreckage where nothing can be built to replace it for a long time. 
Without suggesting that Russia had fully recovered from the communist catastrophe, Putin suggested instead that, quote, at least our society has developed what they now refer to as herd immunity to extremism that paves the way to upheavals and socioeconomic cataclysms. People really value stability, he went on, and being able to live normal lives and to prosper while confident that the irresponsible aspirations of yet another group of revolutionaries will not upend their plans and aspirations, unquote. The catastrophe of communism's rise and rule led inexorably on his account to the catastrophe of its collapse. Quote, many have vivid memories of what happened 30 years ago and all the pain it took to climb out of the ditch where our country and our society found themselves after the USSR fell apart, unquote. The point, of course, is not that America can look to Russia or to Putin for a model to get out of our own accelerating collapse, the evidence of which is all around us, not least in the psychological and cultural meltdown of people cowed and corrupted by the digital swarm and its priests. But Americans must look to Russia's catastrophic experience swapping machinery for soul in an attempt to perfectly orchestrate the collective movement of all. I am glad that it is not my burden to try to ensure that the Russian people can recover swiftly enough from the communist catastrophe to survive and perhaps even thrive in the wake of the digital apocalypse. That's because while I find orthodox theology as authoritative as so many Russians do, my civilization is American, not Russian. And while America faces a special constitutional and cultural challenge in not being able to impose a theocratic solution to the devilish problem of how to resubmit the digital entities to human rule, America also has a special advantage in figuring out how to cope with this challenge. That advantage brings us to the heart of the matter of doing business in the wake of the digital apocalypse. Some of us here, doubtless, personally remember the astonishing spectacle of the Soviets seemingly dominating every field of human endeavor. If this is not fresh enough for you, sit down with Sylvester Stallone's peak Cold War film Rocky IV, where Dolph Lundgren's Soviet Superman, Ivan Drago, fatally knocks out Rocky's dear friend Apollo Creed, and Rocky flies to the USSR to avenge Creed's death in the ring. The soulless Soviet Borg looked poised to defeat America on screen and off in every one of our infinite avenues, most of all the physical, industrial, scientific, and military ones. This was, after all, the entity, the Soviets, that beat us, at least at the start, in the so-called race for space. But the Soviet wager on mastering the movement of human bodies in space-time through the substitution of the technical for the soul was a failure. And the only institution of soul left standing was the much reduced Russian Orthodox Church. Now the challenge for Putin and any Russian statesman is twofold. Not only is a vast labor required to reform the Russian people back into a soulful condition, so too must Russia figure out how to reanimate the Russian body into a condition of physical vitality sufficient to prevent its Christianity from succumbing to the Gnostic temptation, to view the given human form as a despicable curse, and to view the ushering in of the end times as the true form of worship. Contrast this then with the American predicament. Like Russia, we still enjoy a tremendous amount of space. Unlike Russia, we have enjoyed a remarkable length of geopolitical time, free from outside interference, attack, and destruction. Now, the time is short to salvage ourselves from the cyborg theocrats we have spawned. But our space does remain a great advantage, and still more, the culture we developed within that great space, sheltered by our particular form of government. Under digital conditions, what matters even more than the race for space is the space for race. And I don't mean white or black or that kind of race, but a lineage of people from which they really can't escape. We are stuck being American, biologically, culturally, spiritually. There is no time to try surviving the digital apocalypse by transforming into a new and different race of humans or post-humans. 
Elite efforts to transform us into constituent parts of a transhuman cyborg swarm can only do more and greater damage. This graft will not take. This means that in order to mitigate or avoid further damage, we must move our distinctively American given human bodies around in our particular slice of space-time in a way that is particularly healthy for us and protective of us. But let me also be clear with you that the damage I speak of is not just spiritual or cultural damage, but an incredible and probably immeasurable damage to business. Because the way to move us around in the right way to preserve us is, in America, commercial movement, which alone affords us the innumerable paths to fruitful vitality that can fill our vast space with the soulful energy needed to sustain our constitutionally guaranteed form of government. For all the high-level stuff we are discussing here and forcing ourselves to confront, Americans are an irascibly practical people, and the practical reality is that we are stuck as Americans having to pour our soul energy, our enema, as Aristotle would say, into not just worship or family or just personal development, crucial as those things are, but into commerce into the cultural creation and activation of institutions and webs of shared enterprise and common markets. The need for us to be who we are in this sense, despite all the many agonies and sins dragging us down, is one we simply don't share with any other race of people or any civilization state, no matter how innate human trade and barter may be. This is, in an odd sense, the cross we must bear a laborious middle path between mere consumerist gluttony or mere producerist frenzy, between the rapacious use, human use of the world as a mere resource and the rapacious cyborg use of humanity as its own mere resource. In sum, we need our business people to pour their soulful energies into reanimating the quintessentially American commercial spirit and commercial activity of the American people. And what is more, we need them to do so in a way that wrests control of our digital entities back, both from the automated protocols of the machines and from the priestly rituals of the cyborg theocrats. To me, at least, it's fairly clear what this means. I chose to show it more than to explain it by selling my book, Human Forever, in Bitcoin, and publishing it on the Bitcoin blockchain. Bitcoin is one of the world's very most powerful digital technologies. But unlike social credit, or AI, or transhumanist interventions, it is a technology that Americans can, right now, use as consumers as well as producers. Right now, they can build fresh, yet quintessentially American institutions that create valuable, memorable, protective culture and algorithmic markets that reward it on digital foundations, telling compute to do things that strengthen us, not weaken us. My book and the platform called Canonic that made its publication possible are just one example of these kinds of institutions. And ultimately, although the content is always important, it is the form that determines the content. And it is the use of symbol through which we show people without having to explain to them what forms into which they can fruitfully and savingly pour their energies of soul. Nothing I have said here can compare in counsel with what I have been so greatly blessed to do at New Founding with our new publication, Return. Speaking as the editor of the Claremont Institute's American Mind, bold and deep interventions into political contestation are essential to ensuring that an America that arises from the catastrophes of the digital revolution is still in the good sense, recognizably American. Speaking as the publisher of Return, that political endeavor relies in fateful measure on our capacity to decisively reanimate the commercial enterprise of many millions of Americans by creating and driving new digital age brands. Brands similar to, although by no means limited to, Return. I am reliably told by my favorite online etymology site, 
that brands go back to the signature livestock paint jobs of medieval animal husbandry. Of course, in Texas, the power and the authority of the cattle brand needs no explanation. But gone are the days of electric age branding, when made up dreams and visions caused by military technology repurposed for amusement and pleasure to take on the mesmeric guise of a shortcut to nirvana. In the digital age, brands are spiritual wagers Americans must take on their own culture and their own metal. Wagers made to remind our fellow neighbors and citizens of the vitality with which they must still joyfully and fruitfully meet their responsibilities. If the digital retrieves the medieval in ways often alien or dispossessing to most Americans, the founding of brands in this sense reminds our people that here there is more to social order than the four estates, those who work, those who pray, those who fight, and those who write. The brands I have had the honor and I believe the duty to help create so far, foremost among them, the American mind and return, deserve so much of my life insofar as I and my teams labor to make them credible promises of distinctly American flourishing in dramatically new and dangerous conditions through an entanglement of art, commerce, theology, and theory, which no explanation or ethic can deconstruct or vivisect. Here is a human vitality, immeasurable and unpredictable enough to outwit and outpace the digital swarm. Our word, sorry, here, though time is short, is the space it is our responsibility to steward. Our word culture comes from the Latin colere, to tend, to guard, to respect, to practice. The colonist, the husbandman, the settler in the new land, is the true man of culture. Here is our wild frontier, our fruited plain, our dark forest, our high range of mountains, waiting, though time is short, for new pioneers, led now by our men of culture from home to new home and from founding to new founding. Thanks very much. <laughs>